So, uh, welcome to USB Analysis 101, a class where I explain how to use Wireshark to analyze USB traffic. My name is Tomasz Moń. I work as a software specialist at Etapla. The presentation starts with introduction, covering the basic terminologies, bits, connectors, and why USB 2.0 is still relevant. I will also mention the USB transfer types and device classes. Then I will show USB traffic capture options and outline the main difference between software and hardware sniffers. I picked USB mass storage as an example because USB memory stick is a really well-known device. The mass storage USB protocol layer is simple and there is mass storage dissector in Wireshark. At the end, there will be a short summary and Q&A session. Please ask the questions during presentation in the Q&A window. So let's start with the terminology. Both USB and networking use the same words, but with a slightly different meaning. The analogies I present might not be quite exact, but I consider them good enough to get the big picture. USB host can be seen as a requester because it initiates all the communication and also as DACP server because it assigns addresses to devices. Example host is a PC or laptop. USB device is a responder because it responds to host requests. Even when the device is sending data to host, it is essentially responding to host requests. Example device is a mouse. Port in USB means the physical port connector. A host can have multiple ports and every device requires one port. If the host does not have enough ports, then we can use hub. It acts similar to switch or hub known from networking world. Thanks to Hub, we can connect more devices to a single host port like keyboard or USB memory. In order for communication to work, every device needs its address. The address is similar to local IP address, except the range, range is much smaller. After reset, the device defaults to address zero, and then the host sets device address to value from one to 127. Endpoint is essentially a buffer. From addressing point of view, it can be seen as analogy to TCP or UDP port. Each endpoint operates using one of the four available transfer types. USB class pretty much defines the communication protocol. The scriptor is like a data sheet, but the host reads to know what type of device it is talking to. Vendor ID is like the OUI, except the vendor ID is only 16 bit. And product ID is like a product code. It is also 16-bit number. Unlike MAC addresses, vendor ID and product ID pair only identifies the device model, not a particular unit. When USB was introduced back in 1996, the A and B uh, connectors were used. A is at the host side, while B is at the device. Initially, the connector had only four pins, the 5-volt VBUS, the GRAND, and single differential pair D plus D minus. The, uh, as there is just a single differential pair in USB, only half duplex communication is possible. Being a shared bus, there must be some media access protocol. Ethernet uses carrier, carrier sense multiple access collision detection. Wi-Fi does the collision avoidance, but USB is much different. If the host doesn't ask device for data, the device cannot send anything. When the host asks for the data, the device has to pretty much respond instantly as the timeouts are pretty short. Full and high speed timeouts are in hundreds of nanoseconds range. At high speed, in the worst case scenario, when there are five caps in between the host and device, the timeout occurs, occurs if the host does not start receiving response within 1.7 microseconds. Hopefully the USB peripheral handle timeouts in hardware for example, when host reads data, the peripheral will knock the transaction unless the firmware has already armed the endpoint with data. Similarly, when host writes data, the device will knock if the endpoint buffer isn't empty. USB 3 adds two separate superspeed differential pair, the SS transmit and superspeed receive. When, there, when device operates in backwards compatibility mode, it uses dedicated USB 2 differential pair the superspeed traffic happens solely at the superspeed TX and superspeed RX uh, 
USB three is dual simplex as it has one differential pair lane each direction. USB two published in April 2000 featured free transmission speeds low at 1.5 megabit full speed at 12 megabits, which is eight times faster than low speed and high speed at 480 megabits, which is 40 times faster than the full speed. USB three is not so simple because uh, it was initially released in November 2008. It featured only the five gigabits speed, but then in July 2013, a uh, next generation was added with 10 gigabits per second. And then finally in 2017, the, the USB type C connector has been introduced with the USB 3.2 specification, but allows up to 20 gigabits using the two lanes. So it is worth noting that super speed devices operate on completely separate bandwidth than USB 2 devices. All heavy bandwidth users like network cards or storage devices generally use super speed nowadays, so they are not competing for the same bandwidth. USB type C connector is reversible, so you don't have to worry which side is up. As it works either way, uh, in the middle, there are the D plus and D minus signals. They are reversing on the bottom, so you can plug it anyway. The simplest USB devices with Type-C connector only connect the D plus, D, D minus, V bus, which is the five volt supply, and grant. The CC1 and CC2 pins you see here uh, are used for, con are the configuration channels used for USB power delivery features. USB power delivery can be used to change the voltage on the V bus pins. The voltage can go up to 20 volts and maximum current is five amps. To deliver 100 power, watt power, the electronically marked cable assembly is needed. The electronically marked cable includes the USB, USB PD controller chip in the cable itself. USB PD can also be used to configure alternate mode. Example alternate mode is Thunderbolt 3 that operates at 40 gigabits. Another alternate mode is DisplayPort. USB free device can agree with the host. For, for example, the TX and RX is being used for DisplayPort and TX2 and RX2 is being used for super speed USB communication. The SBU1 and SBU2, which are for sideband use, they are used only in the alternate modes. For example, DisplayPort alternate mode uses SBU pins as auxiliary channels. So there are multiple speeds. So the device and host needs to agree on what to use. With low and full speed, it is easy. The host checks which line it pulled up. If D minus is pulled up, then it's low speed. If D plus is pulled up, then it's full speed. High speed was added later and added chirping sequence. The de device initially starts at full speed with the D plus line pulled up. The host starts chirping, full speed devices simply ignore it but the high speed devices will chir chirp back. When the chirping is complete, device and host switch to high speed and D plus pull up, it is disabled to balance the lines. USB free link negotiation is much more complex, utilizing sidewide communication called low frequency periodic signaling. The low frequency is low when compared to super speed, but, but still in the tens of megahertz. All the speed detection happens at hardware level and you won't see that in Wireshark at all. With the USB 4 devices coming soon, you might be wondering if it's still worthwhile to get familiar with USB 2.0. The answer, in my opinion, is definitely yes. USB 2 is not going anywhere. The backwards compatibility is achieved by dual bus and the upper layers are pretty much the same. Every USB 3 hub contains both USB 2 and USB 3 hub inside it. USB hub is the only device that can talk operate at USB 2 and USB 3 speed simultaneously. The new connectors, including the USB type C contain dedicated USB 2 D plus D minus signals. All USB 2 rules apply on these D plus D minus signals. There's a lot of devices that are fine with USB 2 speeds, like keyboard, mouse, or controllers. 
if then the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller comes, it comes with the USB Type-C connector, but it is in fact full speed device. USB stands for Universal Serial Bus. To be universal, it must be able to support many devices. Many devices mean different needs. All possible transfer types are generalized into four types. USB supports plug and play and is able to detect what type of device is connected. Plug and play is possible thanks to control transfer. Every USB device knows how to respond to the get descriptor command. The scriptor contains basic information about device that host can use to know how to talk to it. Control transfers can be also used for vendor commands. For example, for volume adjustment. Control transfer is the only mandatory transfer type. Interrupt is another transfer type, but this name is essentially misleading because this interrupt has nothing to do with interrupts. It is intended to handle things that used to be handled via interrupts in the past. The host will periodically poll the device for interrupt data. The, the polls will happen often enough to meet the latency requirement. Failed polls will be retried. Example use cases for interrupt transfer are human interface devices like keyboard or mouse. Isochronous transfers are good for streaming audio or video. It is periodic with guaranteed bandwidth, but there isn't any retry or guarantee of delivery. And to transfer large data, the bulk transfer should be used. The data can be transferred the fastest using bulk transfer. The catch is there's no guarantee about latency or bandwidth, but for plenty application, it doesn't matter. Example use case for bulk transfer is mass storage or Ethernet data. USB class defines the language host talks with the device. There are some USB specific classes that are not simili similar to anything else, like hub or human interface device. Hit class is actually pretty complex, but in my opinion, it has successfully solved the configuration issues for basic input peripherals. You can pretty much be sure, but the basic functionality of USB mouse will simply work after connecting it to the computer. Some, cl some classes are just simple protocol wrappers. For example, mass storage usually wraps SCSI. Communications device class wraps AT commands, Ethernet flames, or just plain serial data. Printed class wraps IEEE 1284. And there are also vendor specific <laughs> classes. For example, FTDI USB to serial converters use vendor specific protocol. If you have some USB device and would like to write application to talk to it, you can use libUSB. It works out of the box on, window, on, on Linux, while on Windows, it needs generic USB driver. You can install one of the supported libUSB drivers using Zadig. The screenshot shows OpenVisla with libUSB K driver installed. The WCID is crossed out here because the device does not implement Windows compatible ID. If you are a firmware developer and want your device to tell Windows to automatically install WinUSB driver, you can implement the WCID. It is simple as adding a special string descriptor and implementing two vendor feature descriptors. Moving on to traffic capture, the traffic can be captured in software, on Linux with USB mod module, on Windows using USB pickup. There are open source hardware USB 2 sniffers available. OpenVisla, which is not only open source, but also open hardware project, and there's Lambda concept USB 2 sniffer for which only the software is open source. If you have logic analyzer, you can decode low and full speed USB signaling with Sigrog. To my best knowledge, there are no open source USB 3 hardware sniffers. If you are working on one, please let me know. After loading the USB mod module, if you have sufficient permissions to access USB MON, the Wireshark interfaces list will be populated with these USB MON in interfaces. The USB MON zero interface is special interface but groups all root hubs. The other USB MON instances correspond to host controller interfaces. When you list the devices using LSUSB, you can see multiple Linux foundation root hubs. It's not that the Linux Foundation has a chip in every computer out there, but it's a phony device that Linux uses to make the software model easier. 
uh, the hub functionality of a root hub in Linux is uh, implemented by this phony device. Uh, the XACI controller is actually modeled as two root hubs, one for USB 2 and one for USB 3. And when you want to capture some specific device, for example, the data traveler uh, memory stick, you can find it in LSUSB output. Uh, here it is device 8 on bus 2. So the pen drive traffic can be captured on USB MON2 interface. In the LSUSB minus T output, we can see to which port its device is connected. This is the physical port on the, on the hub. Or in some cases, the devices are bundled inside the laptop, like this camera here. Note that the device number displayed for devices connected to XACI host controller is not necessarily matching the address assigned to the device. This is because the address is assigned by hardware while the kernel controls the device numbers. USB mount captures contain the device numbers, so don't be surprised when debugging firmware on your device, but the address the firmware mentions doesn't match the value shown in LS USB or in Wireshark capture. Tomas, uh, there's several people asking if there is Mac OS support. For Mac OS, uh, the Apple has done some USB capture, but you need to disable the system integrity protection to bring the interface up. So after you, uh, so after you disable the uh, system integrity protection, you can bring the XAC20 interface, uh, I think, and then you can capture that in Wireshark but I haven't captured it myself, so I don't know how it works. And there's ongoing uh, topic on the Apple discussion forum. Uh, well, unfortunately they tell that it, it for the for future is still not possible to do that without disabling the system integrity protection. Mm -hmm. So moving to Windows. Uh, the capture engines can be integrated into Wireshark using the XCAP interface. I have the, as you can see here, I have the USB pickup CMD and all the XCAP loaded in the Wireshark XCAP directory. It makes it possible to see the USB pickup and open Vishla in interfaces in Wireshark interfaces list. This screenshot was made on the same computer but the one on the previous slide for Linux. You can see that on Windows, there are only three USB pickup instances, while on Linux, there were five USB mount instances. This is because USB pickup does not have the equivalent to the special USB mount zero interface, and Windows does not logically split the XACI controller into two separate root hubs. By clicking on the, on the gear symbol next to the USB pickup in interface, you can configure the capture options. The options include snapshot length, which is how many bytes of a single record to save. Wireshark used to allow just 64K, then 256K, then one megabit, and now uh, one megabyte, and now 128 megabytes for USB pickup packets, only because the limit has been raised because people were complaining that Wireshark cannot show the captures made by USB pickup. And un unless you know that uh, the application you are using or, or the, your device driver is, is submitting large requests, you should probably keep the default snapshot length value. Uh, you can also configure the capture buffer length. Uh, you can increase it if you notice missing data, but keep in mind that this buffer is allocated in kernel space within the non-page pool memory. By allocating capture buffer in non-page pool, it is guaranteed, but the buffer will always reside in the physical RAM. Non-page pool is never swapped to disk, so you should keep the capture buffer size reasonable. Next, you might want to select what you want to capture. I usually don't capture from all connected devices, but instead I capture from newly connected devices. I start the capture and only then plug in the device. By the way, the capture contains all the necessary descriptors that Wireshark dissectors can use. The option to inject already connected uh, 
devices descriptors into capture data is useful when you are capturing data from device but is embedded into the system and you have no easy way to disconnect it. USB pickup will then take the device and configuration descriptors request into the pickup data. If you don't capture from all devices, you can select individual device you want to capture from. The number in square brackets here is the actual device address. The other option is to capture in hardware. Capturing in hardware is useful when you are debugging host controller driver issues or if both the host and device are microcontroller based and you simply cannot capture in software. All the XCAP options include capture speed uh, and filtering. OpenVisa captures USB 2.0, so the capture speed can be either low, full, or high. This should match the speed of the monitored link. It is quite useful to filter NACT transactions unless you are debugging some weird bug in device driver or in the device firmware. Filtering NACT transactions will significantly reduce the number of captured packets, making the capture file much smaller. When capturing full or high-speed traffic, you can also filter start-of-frame start packets. Every second, there are 1,000 start-of-frame packets on full-speed link and 8,000 start-of-frame packets on high-speed link. So how does Open Visual work? On the left side, there's USB Type-B connector that connects to the capture host. The monitor device is connected to the USB Type-A connector on the right. The USB Type-B connector on the right connects to target host. The link between the target host and monitor device is decoded by the USB transceiver operating in passive mode. USB transceiver translates the differential signaling to ULP. FPGA receives the ULP data and extracts packets from, the, from it. The data is buffered in SDRAM and FTDI, uh, USB to serial converter, connects capture host with the FPGA. The FTDI has two channels. On OpenVisla, one channel is used to load the bitstream into the FPGA, while the other is used to transfer capture data. The only non-volatile memory on OpenVisla is EEPROM chip, but stores FTDI configuration. The FPGA bitstream is always loaded from the capture host at the start of the capture. So speaking of the packets, I put packets in quotes for very good reason. Wireshark shows what the capture engine provided. For example, Leap Pickup USB mod provides the USB packets with Linux header and packets padding. USB Pickup provides USB packets with USB Pickup header. OpenVisla provides USB 2, 1.1 and 1.0 packets. Out of the three, only the last one is described in USB 2 specification chapter eight. Software sniffers capture USB request blocks submitted to host controller driver. The Linux header and USB pickup header contain all operating system specific URB information. If you develop a software sniffer for another system and want to use Wireshark for this section, specify the operating system dependent pseudo header and re request link layer header, header type for it on the TCP dump mailing list. So let's take a look at the actual captures. The example mass storage can be downloaded for, from Wireshark uh, Wiki. Uh, okay, there's some questions, but I will just proceed. Uh, the address displayed in Wireshark includes the bus, device address and endpoint. You can see it here, 3.13.0. The bus ID is the interface on which the data was captured. Here it was USB pickup free. The device address here is 13. Note that if you capture on Linux, Wireshark will display the device number, but it's not necessarily the same, the same as address. 
Tomas, is this something that uh, is in your uh, downloaded capture files that the, that the viewers can follow along with? Uh, yes. This, this, this is the uh, USB pickup file inside this. Uh, USB pickup file, okay. Uh, yeah. Every device has control endpoint zero. When the device is connected, host enumerates it to determine what type of device it is. USB pickup captures include only data after the de device has been assigned an address. As you can see here, the first one is from host to already the 3.13.0. First capture request by USB pickup is the get descriptor request. Every control transfer contains eight byte setup data. Here we can see the standard device request with data traveling from device to host. The request is get descriptor and descriptor type is device. There's only one device descriptor, so the index is left, is left as zero. The language ID matters only for string descriptors, so it is zero here. Device descriptor length is always 18 bytes. And as we want to read the whole descriptor, the WLAN here is 18. So after the device responds, we get the device descriptor. It is shown here as originating from 3.13.0 3 to host. And uh, it is indeed 18 bytes. The binary coded decimal version here uh, BCD USB, it's 2.1.0. And this pretty much tells, but this is USB free device connected using the USB to cable. This is the case here because when I was capturing, I was m capturing it not only in USB pickup, but also, also using the Open Vizsla. And as Open Vizsla captures only USB 2 and connects only the USB 2 lines, uh, the device has to operate at USB 2 speeds. The device class, subclass, uh, and protocol triple indicate what the class code from interface descriptors should be used. Maximum packet size is 64 on endpoint zero. The vendor ID and product ID values identify the device as Kingston Data Traveler. BCD device meaning is up to manufacturer. Here it's simply one. Generally BCD device is the device revision, but for example, FTDI USB to serial converters use it to identify ch chip type. Then we have the string descriptor indexes for manufacturer, product, and serial number. Note that the serial number is under string descriptor free. This particular device has only one configuration and that's it for the device description. So we move on to request the configuration descriptor. So we also, and again, issue the get descriptor command. Now we ask for configuration descriptor. Also, we don't specify language, language because it doesn't uh, it's configuration descriptor, not a string descriptor. And we ask for nine bytes. This is because the configuration descriptor is nine bytes. In configuration descriptor, we can see, but there's the total length of 32. It means that in order to know all the information, information the host should re read configuration descriptor again, asking for the 32 bytes. This configuration has only one interface, as the BNAM interfaces is one. The, the B configuration value is the value that host should use in set configuration request to select this configuration. The configuration doesn't have any human readable string descriptor, so I configuration is zero. Device is not self-powered and cannot wake up the system from sleep. Device claims to draw, draw no more than 300 milliamps from the bus. So now, but we know the total length for the configuration descriptor. We repeat the request for the configuration descriptor, asking this time for the full 32 bytes. 
you might ask why not ask for the maximum possible number of bytes first and let the device cut the lab. Well, the firmware in multiple devices doesn't sanitize USB requests and can crash after getting unexpected values. So we repeated the get descriptor configuration now with the 32 bytes. The first nine bytes are the same as previously. We requested the same descriptor after all. All interface descriptor follow the configuration descriptor. So here uh, we can see that the first interface descriptor is class mass storage. Is the interface number V interface number is zero. So this is the first interface in this configuration. The B alternate setting is the value used in set interface request to activate this interface. Here it is zero. Interface has two endpoints, VNUM endpoints equals two, and operates according to mass storage class. The subclass indicates that the interface simply transports SCSI commands. Protocol mentions that the device only uses bulk endpoints. The subclass and protocol meaning depends on the class. There is no string descriptor describing the interface in human readable form, so I interface is zero. Scrolling down to the endpoint descriptors, show that there are two endpoints, one in, the other one out. The direction is always from host perspective. So in means the, from device to host and out means from host to device. Endpoint one is in endpoint, endpoint two is out endpoint. Both are using bulk transfers. The maximum packet size on both is 512. The P interval value doesn't matter for bulk endpoints. However, for interrupt endpoints, this value indicates how often the host should be polling the data. The interval is in frames. So on full speed, it's uh, one means one millisecond, on high speed, one means 125 microseconds. As this is mass storage interface, SCSI commands will be sent to endpoint two, this is the out endpoint, and the response will be read from endpoint one, which is the in endpoint. So now the host wants to know supported languages in string descriptors. The host requests two bytes of string descriptor zero. The first two bytes indicate, but this is a string descriptor and the total length is four bytes. Wireshark shows malformed packet error because it tries to dissect the full descriptor. This is really a bug in Wireshark as there's nothing wrong here. The, the host requested two bytes, so it got two bytes. So now the host really wants to know the supported languages and it repeats it asking for the full descriptor. We know now that the full length is four. And as we can see here, why, uh, after getting the response, uh, Wireshark is happy and shows that the device contains US English strings. So for subsequent string descriptor requests, it will be using the English United States uh, language ID. So now, the host decides but it wants to know the serial number. The I serial number value in device descriptor was three. Again, we ask only for two bytes as we don't know the length yet. And we ask for the uh, US English string. The US English string descriptor three length is 50. Wireshark tries to dissect the string, but it's not there as we only ask for two bytes. So the same story as, as with the string descriptor zero. So we repeat the string descriptor request, this time asking for 50 bytes. The device responds with the complete string descriptor. The serial number is displayed in Wireshark. USB strings are encoded using the little endian UCS2 encoding. Now the host sets the only 
available configuration. But we have seen uh, in the descriptors earlier. B configuration value is equal to the value found in B configuration value field in configuration descriptor. Not that the W length is zero, so there's no data stage in this control transfer. And now we see something different. In this packet, there is like no USB data, there's only this USB URB metadata. The set configuration response packets contains only OS specific information. Here we can see that the request has been successfully completed. Note that this is pseudo header, the bytes displayed in the byte view were not transmitted on the wire. This information is especially useful for driver developers. It is also useful for normal user as it indicates that the request was successful. So after setting the configuration, host sets the interface. As selected, configuration has only one interface. There's no much choice here and it's just simple. And the same story, the W length is zero. Again, the response contains only the operating system specific metadata. The request has been successfully completed. So now we scroll, uh, now, now we get to the max loon request, which is the class specific request. Host issues get max loon command. The loon stands for logical unit number. Get max loon response is always one byte. USB memory sticks usually have only one loon. Example device with more than one loon is digital audio player that has both internal flash and micro SD card. In this case, this is from a memory stick. The max loon is zero as there's only one logical unit inside this memory stick. So let's skip further down to show how the data is being read from the disk. In packet 215, we have the SCSI command that is being sent to endpoint two. That's the out endpoint. Host sends, uh, host sends this SCSI command. There's the USB mass storage header. This is specific to the mass storage class. Is the, the signature tag data transfer length. But the actual SCSI pilot, payload that follows this, uh, this uh, header is just defined by, the, by SCSI. So to understand what this SCSI CDB read means you have to look, look up the SCSI documentation. So here we can see that the bulk transfer, it was a write to M.2, has succeeded as seen in the pseudo header. So what does the software sn sniffers really show? Device driver submits URB and host controller driver handles URB and reports back to device driver. All software sniffer packets contain operating system specific metadata. URB ID, endpoint, and software sniffers spy on the interactions between device drivers and host controller driver. Both when sending and receiving the data, USB mon and USB pickup capture two packets. First one is from host to device, the other one is from device to host. The, the first one contains the information that the device driver submitted. The second is after the host controller driver has finished processing the data. For control transfers, the first packet always contains the setup data. If the data travels from host to device, then the packet from host to device will contain both the setup data and payload. If the data travels from device to host, then the second packet will contain the data read because it's not known at, the, at this stage. 
for interrupt, bulk, and isochronous transfers, the payload is only in one of the two packets. For writes, the payload is in the first packet, while for reads, the payload is in the second packet. If the read fails or is canceled, then the second packet will contain only operating system specific metadata. For reads, the first packet indicates, but the drive, device driver requested host controller driver to start read attempts. This is useful when debugging host software because if there isn't any data coming from the device, it might be that the host is simply not asking for it. If the host doesn't ask for data, the device cannot send anything. So back to our capture, we can see that the driver now submits read request on the in endpoint. So there's from host to in endpoint, and it's only this metadata that it wants to read. When the URB completes, we can see the SCSI payload, which contains the data stored on the disk. In this case, we can tell that the disk is formatted with XFAT file system. We can notice that this payload is eight kilobytes. So what about the max packet size? Endpoint one maximum packet size is 512 bytes. SCSI respond in this USB pickup packet was eight kilobytes. This is because USB sniffers capture USB request blocks and USB host converts the URBs into packets and packets into URBs. To see USB packets, we have to use the hardware sniffer. So when we look at the hardware level capture, when the driver submitted the SCSI command to out endpoint, it consisted of three packets on the wire. The first one is the out token, but contains the address, endpoint, and five bit CRC. And this packet is nowhere to be seen in the software capture. The second one is the data zero packet. The actual payload and 16-bit CRC, the data zero and CRC is not visible in the software capture. Finally, there is an ACK sent by the device, confirming that it has received the data. I have highlighted here the corresponding USB pickup capture data and what you can see on the wire. As you can see, the USB pickup metadata was not on the wire at all. Only the actual payload matches. So what about SCSI response? If we look at how the data is being read, we notice the in token, then the data packet, and finally ACK. As you can see, the data packet indeed contain no more than 512 data bytes. And basically there are multiple data packets. There's data one, then data zero, then data one again. And it, there are 16 of them in total. So it sums up to this eight kilobytes that we see reassembled uh, in the URB. This is in the whole story as we looked at the filtered data. If we open the non-filtered USB LL capture of the exactly same, uh, exactly same capture session, we can see that after sending the SCSI command, the command was act, but then the host was trying to read the data on this in endpoint and it was being knocked. This is because the device didn't yet finish reading from the flash memory and it didn't have it in the buffer. As the peripherals didn't know what to respond to host, it simply kept knocking. These knocks are very shortly after the, uh, after the request because the timeouts on USB are really, 
really short. And if you looked at the packet counters, you can see that the capture with NAX and solve so start of range filtered contained only 1,512 packets, while this unfiltered one is 211,925 packets. In this case, over 99% of packets are either start of frames or NACT transactions. To sum it up, USB 2 is still relevant today, not only because there are multiple applications where USB 2 speeds are sufficient, but also because USB 3 backwards compatibility with USB 2 is achieved by dual bus. Host initiates all communication. In and out is always from host perspective. Device cannot send data unless host asks for it. The, this is when driver submits the in URB. Software sniffers capture URBs. Every URB is captured as two URB packets. Driver to host controller interface includes data payload from host to device, if any, and host controller interface to driver packet includes data payload from device to host, if any. URB level capture is sufficient for general use. However, understanding USB at the packet level helps make sense out of the URB packets. So now we head to the Q&A and I can see some, I can see some uh, questions. Oh, a little slower. I, <laughs> I guess I read but too late. Mm. I was linked to the captures. So, will we need to wait a while to get Mac ARM USB driver? It really depends on Apple uh, if they incorporate this uh, uh, capture USB capture option in in macOS Big Sur then then it will be out of the box. If, if they don't, then who knows if anyone will implement USB as the software capture on it. Will all, the next question is, will all USB traffic be seen on all ports of the USB hub? Or would you need to be in line to capture all packets of the device? This is pretty complex question to answer because the hubs need to understand all the speeds but there will be forwarding to the devices so if the hub is a high speed hub the usb2 high speed hub it needs to be able to transfer the low speed and full speed data as well as high speed data the, with high-speed data, it's simple because it's just broadcasting it to the high-speed ports. And according to the specification, you might be able to see it on over ports, but in reality, you probably don't. You can always capture just the link between the, the host and the hub, and then you will see everything. And also, the link between the hub and the host is always operating as the fastest speed but the hub supports and the host supports. So it will send the low speed traffic to, to hub using the high speed link. The hub will buffer it and translate that transaction to the low speed device uh, and send it uh, to the port on the on the low speed. The host can keep polling the hub whether it has completed the transaction to the, uh, to the, uh, to the low speed device or the full speed device. Uh, and no, but there's a sample capture in Wireshark Wiki that shows how this 
split transactions work, but it's probably way too much to cover uh, right now here. But yeah, I think that answers the question. Uh, and what do you think of great Scott gadgets that come great fit one for USB analysis? So let me copy that and check it out. So it's hardware hackers best friend with an extensible open source design, two USB ports and hundred expensive pins. Essential gadget for hacking. Uh, high speed USB and Python IP. Serial protocols. Uh, next generation. But looking at this, I don't think it can handle the high speed traffic. Because for the high speed traffic, doing that on the microcontroller like this one is pretty much impossible. It doesn't seem to have the, the physical layer chip transceiver like the open visual does. So for full speed and low speed, probably can do the thing. I'm not sure if there's X caps uh, available for it. But yeah, you can probably you can probably implement XCAP and analyze the data in Wireshark or some just use some different uh, just use some different uh, software with it. Do you have a link for what software you would recommend for someone starting out with USB uh, with USB analysis? Well, I would, uh, if you are on budget, then I would recommend Open Visual uh, because it's, it, it offers the excellent education, educational uh, quality because you can check the actual design, uh, the el electronics design and uh, you can also check the, um, the bit stream for the FPGA that's generated with MIGEN uh, and how it all works. And you can get uh, Open Visual from Sysmocon, uh, Sysmocom uh, webshop. Uh, let me find it here. Mm. Uh, the assembled unit is for 116 euros uh, and this can give you the low speed, full speed and high speed. Uh, if, you, um, if you are not restrained by the budget and can go, uh, uh, yeah, and don't need to ask about prices, then uh, there are these uh, commercial USB analyzers also for USB free. Uh, but you can get, but it's, uh, yeah. I, I, I think you, you cannot get that uh, anywhere near the open visual price tag. But it, it, it probably comes with some good software and, but unfortunately it doesn't integrate with Wireshark at all. So uh, yeah, you might just use it at, at the office when debugging, when debugging uh, some projects you, you're doing at your day job.
But in general, someone starting with USB analysis, I don't think you need a hardware sniffer, unless you really want to go deep down <laughs> and, and write the firmware to, <laughs> to host side or device side or, or hack the, like the peripherals talking to game console and, and all the stuff like that. It's, I think the actual hardware capture is not as important as understanding the principles but, op but the USB operate on. And you can understand the principle by analyzing the sample Wireshark captures. Can you show the USB pickup side? This is the best place to ask questions. Well, USB pickup side is, uh, yeah, it's my side, <laughs> but it's, it looks like from the old internet. <laughs> Uh, because it was, it was made, um, it was made the, uh, as part of my master of science uh, thesis, and uh, it includes some information like the capture format or capture limitations. Uh, but what I plan to do is actually link this particular USB analysis 101 class on the USB pickup website, because I want to di direct people to this talk to understand what the, how the USB really works. So they are not confused and I don't get uh, this uh, GitHub issues, but simply are because someone doesn't understand how USB is working because I, I believe USB is so different than normal networking that it's easy to get confused. But if you, if you want to uh, get some support on it, you can go to the issues page uh, at GitHub. Uh, but some issues are open for many years and it's pretty much I'm the only active developer, I got some contributions from some people, but it's unfortunately not as big as, uh, as Leap Pickup or Wireshark. So, so it's pretty much only me answering these questions. Yeah. You mentioned Sigrock at the beginning. Do you find it useful for USB diagnosis? If yes, what hardware would you recommend for probic electric signals? I mentioned Sigrock only because you might have logic analyzer already and you might be debugging your low cost microcontroller device and want to check what it's doing. Personally, I don't use it for USB diagnosis because OpenVisla XCAP does uh, pretty much uh, everything I need. And if I need more, I extend Wireshark, uh, Wireshark dissection, so so I get better, um, so I get better, um, better tool, and everyone else gets better tool. But Sigrog, I would like to get Sigrog integrated with Wireshark. Some back and forth integration would be really nice. For example, there's this FTDI USB converters. I have recently developed the MPSSE dissector for, for the FTDI devices. And I would absolutely love to be able to export the dissected MPSSE data as a, sig as a timeline signals to Sigrog and analysis there. That would be excellent feature and yeah, I, I, I would love to have that. I just don't know how to do that myself, but uh, yeah, in, in general, Sigrog and Wireshark are complementary and I would, like, I, I would love better integration between the two. Can you describe your most interesting USB debugging situation? Yes, I can. And I can show you first, I can show you first uh, the change that fixed 
the problem. What's the change that fixed the problem we have seen on STM 32F7 microcontroller running ARP Emmet? This fixed, uh, this fixed the issue, but it was really hard to, it was really hard uh, to debug it. Basically, you can read from the description how, how did it work? Uh, okay, I think we still have some time. You can read from the description how, how it did work. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, I, I mentioned uh, what the speeds we, we were running and but we captured the traffic using OpenVersion. And, but without this change, the USB mass storage device connected to the system responded to, uh, was responding to in, in tokens with NAC. And there were excessive ink tokens generated about 666, 667 nanoseconds after the NAC. With this commit, the ink tokens are gener generated no sooner than 10 microseconds after the NAC. So this high frequency of the in NAC pairs wasn't the biggest problem. The biggest one, but it was actually triggering. Uh, it was continuing to send the in tokens after reading all the data that it was supposed to read. And if the device is not supposed to give you any more data, you can keep reading forever. It will simply keep knocking you. So the uh, USB mastery device won't have extra data available on work in endpoint after the expected data has re was received by host. In such case, the cycle is only hundreds of nanoseconds and the M MCU has no time for anything else and as, uh, eventually the watchdog kicks in. So the problem manifested not only on the bulk endpoint but also doing control transfers. An example scenario when this fix is asked uh, applied is just a normal transmission. But without this commit, after the data stage, after the ask was received, the host did send an extra in token to which device responded with stall. This is expected from the device to respond with stall because the, the control transfer, they have fixed amount of data. In the setup stage, it tells how much data you really want. So if you keep reading past that, the device has nothing better to do than to stall. And yeah, it was causing the problem. So after fixing it, yeah, with this little, little line that my colleague at work, Irene has made, everything was fine. So that's like the most interesting USB debugging uh, work I have done. Yeah, having Wireshark filtering in I2C would be wonderful. Yeah, for this I2C, I would like actually to pass the I2C uh, signals to Seagrog and uh, analyze it there. But writing this sector for I2C in Wireshark, oh man, that's, that's going to be tough. That's going to be really tough because it's bidirectional line and yeah, it's, yeah, Wireshark is not suited for such protocols yet. Uh, we have some LOL. I'm not sure what this refers to. Probably this, this single line, but fix the problem. Uh, okay, so. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay, is there any more unanswered question? So I showed the USB pickup side. Uh, 
can you describe what's interesting USB debugging situation? I describe that. Um, okay, so that's that's all. I can't see anything else in the chat. So uh, if there are no more questions, then I think we will end the session. I will, I will hang for a while in Discord so you can uh, just mention something else. Please fill the, uh, please fill the uh, survey, the, whether you like or not this presentation, if you think, if you think it's it has been good or <laughs> if I should concentrate on some things and, and omit some others uh, as it was my first time speaking at Sharkfest and I hope uh, it was received well but I will only know after the feedback so just <laughs> yeah write whatever you feel about it <laughs>